humbled and honored to be here. <coughs> so um, I guess I'll just get started. Um, if you Google the, if you Google glass blower, uh, this is the first image that comes up, and I, I find that kind of funny. And while this man appears to be engaged in, a, in quite a, you know, a, a classic endeavor of blowing glass, um, I'm not sure that this is the image that I have of, of a craftsman, because the image that I have of a craftsman is somebody like this, and. This is, um, this is my friend, uh, Fred Cresswell, and we just lost him uh, a little while ago, and this is, he is my idea of a true American craftsman, and he is the reason why I'm standing here today. I, um, I met him when I was 17, and I was uh, extremely impressionable at that point, and he was an extremely impressive person. Um, a short list of things that he was, was an expert welder, fabricator, furnace builder, electrician, carpenter, heavy truck mechanic, smuggler, champion dog breeder, world traveler, heavy equipment operator, glass blower chemist, conservationist and inventor. He also raced motorcycles professionally and semi-professionally for Triumph for about 10 years. He was a general doer of things. Um, and despite his kind of orneriness and prickliness, uh, or maybe because of it, I was able to be his apprentice off and on for 15 years. He taught me a lot. Uh, he first exposed me to glass blowing, but he also exposed me to a lot more. He made his home in Sonoma County, California, what I think to be one of the most beautiful places in the world, and he spent a lot of time outside. And sort of following his lead, I like to um, get outside. I like to get outside as much as possible and um, kind of move and, and do things literally and figuratively outside of my, my comfort zone, have some adventure. I think it's this sort of impulse to, to, to stray, you know, as far as you can and gather new experiences, the catalog new ideas and forms and get what nature has to offer us that I think is really important. This is in uh, Big Sur, California, and that's sort of what happens when I have a little bit of time to myself. I tend to drive out in the middle of nowhere and uh, find new places where there aren't a lot of other people around. Um, Sonny was very deeply interested in things. He was genuinely interested in so many things, and I, I find myself getting deeply interested in things as well. My wife, Belle, says I, I get obsessed with certain things, and right now I'm interested in, I'm stuck on this interest in, in plants, and uh, Belle and I work a lot in our, in our garden. Uh, Belle's my wife, and we work in our, in our garden in Portland, Oregon quite a bit. I like to go in, up in uh, Oregon. There's a lot of mushrooms around, so we do a lot of mushroom uh, mushroom hunting. And, and this is uh, my niece, Isabella, with the largest chanterelle I've ever found. <laughs> I'm also um, up in Oregon. It's a very nice place. I I'm, I'm get deeply interested in swimming holes during the summertime. And uh, <clears throat> that's the sort of stuff I like to do. But I also get deeply interested in blowing glass. And I started out, like everyone else, with glass, uh, struggling with it, and uh, luckily there aren't too many images of my earliest first couple of years blowing glass. I'm glad they're not around. Um, but I found relatively quickly that uh, the glass and I sort of worked well together, and I was able to progress at a, at a decent rate where I was a, not as frustrated as, as I see some people getting frustrated in the beginning times. I was very lucky that way. I did have a few floppy bowls in there for sure, but I don't have, there weren't many floppy bowls. Um, I started making glass in high school, not in grad school or anything, so I didn't, I wasn't, I was particularly unburdened by any thoughts of what my, my quote unquote work was. It was designed to sell. There was no pretense for me to make it for any other reason other than to sell these pieces and, you know, to come up with a little bit of a little bit of money, so we made a lot of these small blue bases, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. <clears throat> um, a little bit later, I got to work with a man by the name of Carl Radke. I worked as his apprentice off and on for about seven years at Phoenix Studios in Harmony, California, Central Coast. And Carl was a master of this um, uh, Tiffany reproduction, the, the luster wear. Um, and so we made a lot of traditional forms, a lot of feathering, and the, you see the traditional jack in the pulpit there. And a, of course, a, a fish, a fish there, you gotta make the fish. So, um, I strangely paid for college making work like this. Uh, in part because college back then, uh, uh, it's 
State College of California was still not very expensive. Thank goodness. Um, so I, I, I sold glass out of the back of my truck like this, and I, I begged galleries <coughs> to uh, take pieces, and I had sales at my parents' house and all that kind of thing. Um, so I found that there's just a strange inverse relationship um, with regard to um, my development in, in, in and out of school is that selling glass sort of offered me the opportunity to go to school and in school I sort of developed more ideas surrounding what I was doing rather than a lot of people that start developing ideas surrounding their, their, their work in grad school and then try and pay for grad school after the fact with their work. I was very fortunate to be able to do that. So um, I went to undergraduate school at San Luis Obispo, California Polytechnic State University at Cal Poly. I started in as a business major because I had no idea what I wanted to do. And after four years, I realized that that wasn't the place for me anymore. And I switched to art, uh, studio art, after four years. And it took me seven years to graduate, <laughs> which was great. They actually had to kick me out. Um, there was, since the Polytechnic uh, School, they didn't have um, a glass program. They didn't even have a degree in glass. They, so I have a Bachelor of, of Science in Studio Art. And that was about the end of my, um, my formal education. But um, the thing, the couple, I didn't have a glass program, but they did have a great teacher. And his name is George Jersich. And what happened with George is that I was in the beginning glass blowing class, and I had worked like this because I'd been doing it before. And, I brought on all these bases on the table, you know, and uh, lined them all up, and I was all very proud of myself, thinking I was a big hot shot. And George just sort of shook his head and he said, you know, I can go down to Baja, California, or wherever, and get all this stuff. It would be made better, and it would be half the price of what you think this is worth. And I sort of, sort of stung a little bit, um, but it was like, he, he said, Think, does the world need another glass vase, really? Does the world really need another glass vase? Have you thought about that ever? And of course I hadn't. So that sort of got me to thinking about other things that you could make out of glass, other roles for the vessel form, right? So um, I was doing my wanderings outside around San Luis Obispo. I found this dandelion. I was you know, kind of tripping out on it and just the symbolism or whatever. But I wanted to preserve it so I could study it further. And um, it dried out in my room and I made a a bell jar over it just to keep the dust off of it and to keep it safe. And this piece, I still have it. It's, the dandelion is totally untreated. It's 15 years old now. But it sort of, that wasn't the first jar that I made like that that wasn't, that sort of had some sort of dubious function. And it sort of started a dialogue with me. And I started taking the pieces that, um, that I was, you know, things that I was looking at in my outdoor experiences and, and putting them physically in the glass. It seems in retrospect now that what I was sort of using the glass vessel as like a metaphor for my own experience, you know, and taking the things that I was collecting and looking at and internalizing them in this way. That's poison oak on the left. Um, I'm very allergic to poison oak when I walk around outside, so I thought I'd actually bring it into my room and live with it for a little while. <coughs> and uh, I, I mean, guys like this. So when you're in school, and I, I was freed from that pressure of what, having to sell work, these. I was exploring with the forms, and those are glass guys dipped in wax, and they're in jars, and uh, it's just having fun, you know, exploring, completely unfocused, just no one was telling me what I had to make, I didn't have to sell anything, so I made these kind of these strange creatures, and they were dubbed subsequently bizarre in a jar. Um, as you can see, it was this very playful work, I didn't know where I was going, but um, the, the funny thing was is that when I put all the vases and the nice vases that I thought were so nice trying to work so hard and refine next to this work, it inevitably showed up next to each other at some point. The people that came to see it inevitably responded to this work far more than the vases. By 10 to 1, people were just like, what is actually happening with this? Forget about those vases over there. So that was encouraging. Um, I started to make a little bit more experiments and solid working and making objects and the glass hammer was one of the ones where I sort of, um, it became a, a, another sort of ironic tr transformational piece. Um, I was looking at the work of John Buck and, and I'm married to the glass as a, as a material and 
Mr. Buck here seems like he's married to wood as a material, but he's not using the wood to make a boat or a wooden bowl or turn a wooden bowl. He's using it to like make a new language. You know, these are I can see, I see each of these forms like he's he's trying to communicate. He's taking his experiences of the world and and translating them into his craft. And I, I think this sort of drills down into the point of why people create in general, um, like putting the material that we work with in the service of this basic humanist impulse I, I feel like a lot of us have to gather the knowledge and experience that we receive through our five senses and interpret them in our own way and then communicate them to others. So if you can use you know, the, the, the thing that you're married to, the craft process or the material that you're married to, to create some sort of communication, that's a plus. Now, what am I trying to communicate with this? I'm not sure, I gotta be honest. I mean, this is just, a, it's, it's, it's another, part of experience is a charged object um, that uh, that makes people feel odd, it makes me feel odd, so I have this compulsion to make it. It's like, um, why not? I, I think that making objects like this, <clears throat> they're new objects, they sort of, um, they're, you're not used to seeing them made out of that type of material, so it, if it, I'm striving for this unseen kind of unknown, this new dialogue, this, I'm just, um, if, I, if I consider my work as, in part, a, a dialogue with a viewer, that this is like my argument, I guess, you know, these, uh, in choosing these objects and, and taking them out of the everyday or, and, and, and creating things that are a little bit more un, unexpected, that, that, that's where I tend to go with it. And I try not to ask myself um, terrible, too many terrible questions, you know, about the whys and, and hows of everything, because I find that to be quite paralyzing if I ask myself why too much when I make objects, you know, like this, um, I, I tend to get completely paralyzed. Um, and so I, I, I just I make a lot of these things, and I'm not really prone to abstraction, as you can see. A lot of this work is pretty literal; it's pretty visceral. If if they're interesting or successful at all as objects, um, it's because they're it's because of this unexpected quality of the glass, and maybe. There's a hint of irony to it, like the glass hammer. So they're a little bit about the process and a little bit about the material. They're a little bit about art, but they're also a little bit about craft. And they're, the concepts are, are developing here, as, as you can see, and the execution is also developing. When I was uh, graduated, when we graduated from college, we had to figure out something else to do, and uh, money became imperative again. And so three partners and I uh, built Central Coast Glass Artists Studio in Atascadero, California. And uh, we built every single item in the shop. We, got, we bought ourselves a welder and welded up all the furnaces and put in, got the refractory bricks and built all the furnaces, every single piece of equipment. And um, then we were all broke and we were all, um, had a brand new studio and we're broke so we were all in this pressure situation to make a lot of work very quickly. And this is some of the first stuff I made in that shop. And in a pressure situation, I have sort of this unavoidable tendency towards the Baroque, as I, as I call it. Things get larger and more complicated, I can't help it. It's just, that's how it is. So my wife, being a high school art teacher, suggested, or we communicate very well that way, her being a high school art teacher, she gives me all types of very good advice. And she said, for every new detail element that you add, why don't you subtract one? So I, uh, this is good. So I. Um, a lot of my work you'll see coming up is sort of not dealing with color. That's the element that sort of took it all over the edge a lot of times. So I work mostly in clear glass and a little bit of black. And then like everyone, all glass blowers that are in love with the process, you get sort of sucked into the rabbit hole of, of cup making pure process. It's like practicing the piano, right? Um, or I like it to liken it to skateboarding as well, where you can never say you're going to be a master skateboarder or a master piano player. You can keep practicing for the rest of your life. And you'll never, you'll never, you can always get better. You can always get better. So this is, this is good practice. Uh, muscle memory, fine tuning things, timing, precision, and making complex uh, moves feel natural. And it's informed this body of work, which. This is sort of how I make my living now, for the most part. These are uh, sculptural bell jars, very decorative, and um, people, um, I sell them, you know, private commissions mostly, uh, 
people, lots of people like to um, put their objects in inside because whatever you put inside one of these jars ends up sort of taking on that sacred quality that the dandelion had on that first bell jar that I made. It takes it out of a uh, normal context. And so some people like to not only protect their items but also elevate them a little bit. But then some people don't have their own items and they like the ones that I put in there. So I still am married to a little bit of this um, Naturalia, these are 24 karat gold plated objects inside of these jars and again there's this tendency towards the Baroque, they sort of tend to get out of control. Um, if you were at the demo yesterday you can see in the one picture on the left a Nautilus shell on the top of the thing. I made a Nautilus shell yesterday. That's one of the places where I use them. Um, I, have, I make lots of arrangements of small pieces in here and these are all elements that I've drawn in my, in, drawn from um, walking around that I've found or you know collected or, from the in, the, in the out, and they're all in this cabinet that I have, um, my own cabinet of curiosities. This is one little drawer. There were many, many drawers that look like this. Um, the drawers have remained closed and everything is kind of housed in there. My, my wife likes things rather sparse, <laughs> so we, we try and keep this, um, keep this hidden. But um, these jars, they have different layers on them. I've experimented with surface treatments just to make uh, more layers of, you know, the deeper that you look into it, the closer you can get. This is a, a photographic-based uh, sand etching process. You can add another layer of detail to the surface. And then this is the last of the jars that I made like that. I added a little bit of uh, charcoal color. So that was, that's where those are at at this point. So, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Sonny just for a second because he taught me uh, uh, all things about uh, working in the hot shop as well. Sonny was a stained glass artist first, um, and I think he kind of got bored with that pretty quickly because there's a lot of uh, tedious repetition that goes on with making uh, the type of Tiffany reproduction lamps that he was doing at the time. Um, so, he got into hot glass and he built his own glass furnace, naturally. Um, built it right outside under his wooden barn. In, the, in his wooden barn he built a gas furnace, started blowing glass in there. But um, he didn't like how efficient that was and the fire hazard was kind of intense so he started um, to communicate with the uh, Canthal Corporation which made electrical elements in Germany. And he was the first American as far as I know to contact them to send him uh, these electric elements and he took, they did, they sent him some and, and in the very early 70s, he built the first electric glass furnace in the country um, and started melting glass uh, electric. And I thought and that was it's pretty impressive. And he started um, being kind of unsatisfied with his uh, range of colors in the glass that he could um, experiment with in the hot shop too, because they were all coming out of Germany as well from the Kugler from the Kugler uh, company. So he started making his own colors and melting his own colors. He delved deep into the chemistry of colored glass chemistry and started to do all that himself. And then he got tired of sending his glass color samples to Corning. Because in Corning, there's, they measure that different colored glasses have different expansion and they don't, that there's compatibility problems with different colors. And he got tired of sending his glass samples all the way across the country to Corning to be measured with their dilatometer. Is a, it's, a, it's a very tiny furnace that heats the glass, little glass rods up to 2,000 degrees and measures their expansion and contraction within 10 thousandths of an inch. Um, so he built his own one of those as well. And I can't imagine how difficult that was to do. So the, all this translates, he, he, he didn't like to work in the hot shop when he finally got to blowing glass. He didn't like to work in the hot shop with any assistants. And so I, when I originally learned how to blow glass from him, um, I learned how to do all the work in the hot shop by myself. He also invented a lot of machines to and it help with that process. Things that would keep the blowpipes turning, torches in weird places, and it was very interesting to watch him run around. So I work in the hot shop alone most of the time. It's the hot shop I work at um, right across the Columbia River in Vancouver, Washington. It's a public studio. I rent time by the hour. After owning a hot shop, I find this much easier arrangement. I don't have to take care of all the equipment anymore. I'm not very good with working with assistants. I don't delegate responsibility very well. Uh, the assistants always just end up standing there staring at me. <laughs> Why don't you work a different way? Um, but 
I, so I, instead of working at a, uh, I, so I, I just type, tend to work faster. And if you were at the demo yesterday, you can see lots of times I have a rod in both hands and I'm running around like a, in circles like a chicken. But uh, I think it's sort of that way of working is sort of reflected in the finished product of my work, which is great because over time my process is evolved where if I can't make it in the hot shop, I can figure out another way to do that. And my other way to make what I want to make outside of the hot shop is to make lots of different small parts in the glass shop hot and then cold fuse them after the fact in my cold working studio after I've prepped them and create basically what amounts to a three-dimensional collage after the fact. And I'll explain more about that in a second. Um, to put more emphasis on cold working than hot working, it makes the process, um, it takes longer from start to finish of a piece because it can take up to you know, several months to finish an involved piece rather than the 40 minutes to two hours it takes to usually sculpt something on a blowpipe. But it's more efficient for me, especially energy wise, because it, the glass studio is so energy inefficient usually. There's a lot of fuel and electricity going into running a shop like this. So um, I think uh, Sonny would appreciate this, this note and this nod to efficiency, even though he was hated cold work. He hated it. No patience. So after I'm done, I knock the pieces off the blowpipe. I take them into the cold shop. And this is my lapidary wheel. It's a diamond-coated um, magnetic disc on that wheel. It spins around very quickly. It's water-fed. I'll take a part that I've made, you see on the middle photograph, that's a, one of the finials for the tops of one of the bell jars. And I'll grind the, the point where it's been connected to the blowpipe or the punny rod, and it ends up with an extremely flat, to about ten thousandths of an inch, um, completely unfaceted surface with just enough tooth. And then after that, I use, um, I make my, my compositions and, and assemble them. And here's an example. These I call these dandelions. The one on the left is it's, they're larger than basketballs, and the one on the right has over a hundred of the little seeds on it. And this is what they look like. I make all the seeds, and then the cores, and then I grind this each one of those joints and prep them extremely carefully. And um, then I use a different variety of um, sometimes it's a UV, uh, archival UV curing. Uh, type of epoxy or a two-part epoxy, low expansion, high optic quality um, adhesives. And in this way, I'm able to build larger and, again, more, more Baroque. Some actually called this type of work space goth one time, and I'm not sure. It sort of works, but I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> it sort of describes it. But, um, you see there's more layers going on, All the, you can, there's a little bit of hand etching uh, text that goes around both of those pieces. And these are just the development of the objects in the bazaar and a jar, that's sort of where it's gone. Um, I work a lot from commission to commission as well, and this forces me out of my comfort zone a little bit, which is great. Uh, a good friend of mine is a portrait painter, and he asked if I could make him a glass frame. And so he, we traded, he painted a portrait of my wife, and I made him a glass frame. And I never would have made a glass frame otherwise had I not accepted that, that challenge and that commission. So I really like accepting commissions a lot of times, especially if they're pretty far out because they get me going directions I never would have done. And I learn new things and have, meet new people and go to new places and just add more, adds more um, tools to the toolbox, as it were. But these pieces get a little bit more difficult in that the ones coming up in that you can start from a common center with this process and just keep adding parts and building and building and building until you get to infinity and it gets too large and unwieldy. But when you have um, several joints that are connected at once and they have to be, you know, start from a one spot and then come back around and meet again with zero tolerances, the glass is extremely unforgiving and it becomes challenging. The order in which you grind the pieces becomes very important. Um, and how you know the order of assembly and all the parts becomes very complicated. This is the pushing limits of that. Um, this uh, designer asked me if he could, if I could make him a chair, and it had elements of like my jars in it. This is about this. This is about this tall, and um, I guess there's some a little bit of functionality in that. But I wouldn't want to be the first one to sit in it. <laughs> the um, this is all one monolithic piece. And it's very heavy, and it's extremely fragile. And what happens is you try and ship something like this, and everything kind of goes out the window. Your process, you know, 
who cares about your process? If it can't get to where it's going in one piece, then um, it doesn't really matter. Um, these photographs are all I have. This piece was broken in shipping, and I have no idea where it is. It's, it's gone. It's lost. So I got to thinking about how to design pieces in a different way. And because shipping is an issue. You know, if we, if we make these things to go to people's houses, and they're too delicate and too involved, they have to ship things a different way. This is a six and a half foot long syringe, sort of like the one that I made at the, the hot demo yesterday, but how to transport something. This is the crate in order to take it to the crater, to get crated. <laughs> you spend a lot of time doing this, and so oftentimes cre creating the packaging for the object to ship is as creative as making the original object. Unfortunately, <laughs> So I made this, and obviously this is very fragile, but I designed this specifically to be taken apart. So each one of these threads is threaded into this, into this mirror, and it comes all apart, and it can be shipped very, very safely. And so breaking down these, because of the shipping issue, breaking down these parts into various components and focusing in on each component to make it work became uh, a goal. Uh, and making things out of component parts and being able to assemble them and re deassemble them and reassemble them, got me to thinking in a kind of a mechanical way. Like, this would be a nightmare to ship. This is a commission. Someone asked if I had made a candelabra. I hadn't, so I made this. And it comes apart into 10 pieces for easier shipping. This led to um, larger projects uh, and more possibilities. I saw, this is a artist, Bandu Dunham. Bandu Dunham is a torch worker, and he made this steam engine. And I saw this thing of, quite a number of years ago, I walked in and I didn't even have to get within 40 feet of it, it was across the room, and it's spinning around and that wheel's moving around and it's huffing and puffing and spouting steam off and chugging along, and it completely blew my mind. I thought that was the most awesome thing I had ever seen in my life. I didn't, I, like I said, I just stood there and watched from across the room for a good half an hour and just, you know, my head was turned around that wheel. It was great. And so that was a big, a big, a big turning point for me. And it made me realize that there are a lot of possibilities out there. Right about the same time, Sonny and I were building on a furnace, because he built furnaces for other people as well. And Sonny and I were building a furnace, and it was a new design that we hadn't worked on before. And the top of it, the lid to open it, was uh, unfamiliar. And he, at one point, was staring at it, kind of stumped. And I'm staring at him, like, what are we going to do, boss? And he looked at me and he said, what would you, you know, what would you do? How, how would you solve this problem? And I had some ideas, but the idea that, that he didn't know what to do, I sort of, he, he, for, for an old cranky guy, he was um, making himself uncharacteristically vulnerable to me at that moment. And in asking me what I thought, I sort of realized that he was just making it up as he went along, you know, like, he didn't, he didn't know what to do. Even old bulls like him, didn't, they don't know what they're doing all the time. They we're all just making things up as we go along every day. Everyone's doing it all the time. And at that point in my life, it was an extremely liberating concept to me. And it freed me up to pursue a lot of ideas that you know, might, may or may not fail, but they just sort of pushed at all types of new subjects, including this idea of functionality and that I've sort of uh, carried carried through my work unconsciously all this time. I started making um, parts that move glass on glass connections. Like this, this thing is pretty small, but the you know it turns and the pedals go around and the and the wheels turn and it rolls along. And I'm experimenting with an air twist detail. These objects roll along pretty smoothly, and they have a glass on glass axle wheel system, and they they roll nicely and have pleasant little squeaks. Um, that ox card is about this big. Um, and experimenting with the surface qualities of the glass, you know, etching. <clears throat> this balance um, was the first, like, truly functional, functional piece. Uh, the, it's accurate to within a gram or two. And what I got really excited about in this was engineering that mechanism whereby, you know, the, the pivot point of that balance arm, making those parts on the um, and the blowpipe, which to anyone walking up would never have any idea of what I was making. It, it certainly weren't beautiful looking, but to be able to mechanically 
focus in on those little parts in order to make them work. You know, I'm sitting there with the calipers and getting it all just right. That, to me, is the, the most really creatively satisfying. And it's led to other things like this. Uh, this is a seismograph for measuring earthquakes based on one of those pesky laws of physics that uh, you know objects in motion tend to stay in motion and objects at rest tend to stay at rest. <coughs> um, it measures the earth shaking in three directions. The, those are the pivot points um, where they, they measure right to left, back and forth, and then the third one on the right is on a spring and it measures the earth shaking up and down. It's the X, Y, Z axis and it's actually an ancient design. It's an ancient Chinese design. So it's, it's like a thing, that's something that looks complex, but it has this rather elegantly uh, understated you know, functional component to it. It's based on very simple and straightforward principles. This is the first time I ever used any kind of motor in my work. It's a three-quarter RPM motor that slowly pulls that paper through there, and then the pens wiggle back and forth. I made it at a studio that um, was right next to some train tracks, train tracks. So I tried to, the goal was to get it to register the train as it went by. And we got it to that point. Um, this piece you're familiar with, it's in the other room there. Um, this is sort of along those same lines. I saw one of these, um, I was in between commissions, and this is the sort of thing that I make in, like, in my free time, the sort of exploration that I do. And um, I saw a friend, a friend's mother had one of these in, in their dining room, um, with different format, the, more of the traditional format spinning wheel that you tend to find. And, uh, what first drew me to it was the look of the turned wood and how a lot of those bell jars and stuff, sort of the rings stacked up, has that look of turned wood in a lot of the traditional spinning wheels. But moreover, I was interested in, the, in that, again, that sort of simple elegance of the, of a, of the mechanism in that it's, it's doing this sort of complex work, but it's, it's a simple thing to, to, it's a rather simple object when you break it down into its component parts. Um, so I started to break, pull that thing apart in my mind and I got some books and I did some research on spinning wheel and I figured out the hardest parts that would be the hardest parts for me to make and I started there. I liked the idea of using a craft material, the, the glass at this point, to sort of refer to another, glass, uh, another material, meaning the, uh, you know, the fiber arts. It sort of brought in a little bit of that, that iron the you know ironic quality that the glass hammer had you know for example that the seismograph had in you know the, the fragility of it <clears throat> so spinning wheel <clears throat> was actually made in this shop right here this is my garage uh, at the time that was my cold shop it was a one-car garage, too small for me to park my truck in with nothing in it, let alone all my stuff. And it sort of looks, this is what it looked like when I changed my, when I uh, moved into a new shop. It sort of looks like a madman works in here. Um, <laughs> moving on to the next project. This, I could talk about this project for another hour and a half, so I'm gonna try and, try and keep it short. If you um, have any further questions, please. Let me know afterwards. This, um, although some of you are f um, fortunate enough to see this uh, in Houston, I, I believe. Some of the people from the James Reynolds Alliance were in Houston when this was up there. But this is a glass harmonica. This is uh, a musical instrument invented by Benjamin Franklin. It was made popular by Mozart uh, in the early 1800s. And it was made infamous by uh, Anton Mesmer. That's the term, this instrument is the reason why we have the term mesmerized, because uh, Anton Mesmer was a bit of a crackpot. He used to get society folks into his parlor and perform his you know, crazy wizard dance and the ethereal notes of the glass harmonica would mesmerize his clients into his you know, subtle manipulations. Uh, and he would take their money, basically, he was a charlatan. <laughs> but, um, so the concept is that these are nested glass bowls turning on a spindle in front of you. The player dips his fingers in water and the glass resonates like the, your finger moving around the edge of a wine glass. And that kind of nice ethereal tone. So my friend Ethan and I, who share a, um, we share an interest in antique musical instruments and just general antique technologies uh, in general. He's, 
he's a composer and an installation artist, and he works a lot with um, experimental sound, and he was interested in player pianos and a lot of this antique technology. So we were really interested together, got to talking about the glass harmonica and how we could reinterpret it. So I came up with this goofy drawing, and we thought, wait, wait, this, we can do this, we can do this. Let's figure out how to do it. We'll get some motors, and we'll get a, uh, figure out a way to make a finger, and we'll get the bowl spin around, and we'll tune it, and it'll be great. So I drew this sort of semi-official looking thing up and pitched the idea to um, uh, Namita Wiggers, who is a curator of the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland, Oregon. We actually, I made a few test bowls, and we rang them, and we fed the tunes and the tones in Ethan's computer, and he pitch shifted them to make a composition. So this is what it could sound like. And we played it for Namita, and she loved it. And she just so happens she had an opening in the museum schedule nine months from then. <laughs> and it just so happens they had a little bit of money right then. Who knows why? So they commissioned this piece. And a little word of advice: if you ever find yourself in a similar position. Figure out how the thing is going to work. Make a prototype before you pitch it to a museum and have a show in nine months. Because we ran into a lot of problems. And I'm not even going to, I can't even list all of them. But it turns out that pressure that is used, that you unconsciously use to make the bowl of the wine glass resonate is a pretty subtle pressure. And it's pretty hard to duplicate that pressure and to be able to control it mechanically. Um, also, the actual interaction of your finger touching the glass um, that makes it resonate, that kind of slip stick, they call it a slip stick interaction. Um, it needs, you need water, you need distilled water and or alcohol, which is two things that you, everyone knows you can't have in a museum or a gallery. So that was another problem. We had to figure out how to get the bowls turning at the right speed, all of the motors that we use to turn at 30 RPMs, which is what we determined, 30 RPMs, what we need. Those type of gear motors are extremely loud, louder than the bowl, <laughs> a lot louder. If you attach the motor directly to the spindle that holds the bowl there, that was the way we figured out how to mount them, the spindle acts to transfer the sound from the motor and that acts like the bell of a trumpet. So it actually amplified that motor noise. We decided in order to fill the space of the gallery, we wanted to hang them vertically on the wall. So these bowls would be spinning on the, on the wall, and all of our prototypes were on the table. And as soon as we upended them, they didn't work anymore. We had to figure out how to tune them. Because you, once you blow the glass, when it's hot on the end of the pipe, you can't, you can't, there's no way to figure out what tone it's going to be. It doesn't resonate when it's hot. So I blew all of these bowls and came up with a way of making them as thin and as round as possible. And then the, they came off the end of the pipe and they were all these really rough tones. So Ethan done, downloaded a program on his computer and we rang these and I took them onto the grinding wheel. And I very, very slowly, we took each pitch of each bowl, and the pitch is based on the thickness of the wall, the thickness of the glass, the size of the bowl, the shape of the bowl. And we slowly remove material from the rim until they fit into a certain scale that Ethan determined would be the best scale for the bowls that we had. So in a sense, the glass actually chose what tone the, the end piece wanted to be in. And while we were doing this, um, we proposed it in spring. And when we were doing the work, it was in my garage in December. So we were grinding all those bowls, and that's how cold it was outside. I had, we had a bucket of warm water next to the thing to put our hands in every few seconds. Um, and then how to control these bowls. So we, we, we hired an uh, electronic engineer and he made us some control boards. And these are little servo motors that control the ailerons in a remote control airplane. And they were used to pull cables through the wall that activated the lever system that intoned the, the finger that we made in order to intone the to touch the edge of the bowl. So the, the, those little motors are in the wall and they, they pull that cable, which activates that, leather, that lever system, all made out of glass, of course. And uh, we made these little, we call them bird houses, to put in the, inside the walls that held the motor, motor noise. Um, they're all insulated. Um, we had to buy the motors from France 
they were designed to run kidney dialysis machines bedside, so they were pretty quiet. But when we ordered them, it was July. Turns out the French don't work in July and August. <laughs> so we had to wait until the very end, right when, you know, before we had to do the project in order to see if, if, you know, to get the right motors. But so what happened eventually, we decided we needed 40 units, so we went into mass production. And I, ended, I made about 100 bowls. We ended up using about 40. We made uh, all of those. The bird houses made lots of units and some pedestals. The smallest bowls were the size of a wine glass. The largest ones were the size of like a sink. Um, and we put them up on the walls. With the, you know, all the mechanics are in the back and the magic is on the outside. And this was up at the Museum of Contemporary Craft for almost four months. Each wall is a different circuit. There's seven to eight bowls on each circuit, uh, of five circuits. And so each circuit has a different program uh, and duration. And it's a random, an intentionally random sequence on, in, interacting between these five circuits. So what you get, in effect, is a kind of continuous, non-repeating, uh, overlapping, ev continuously evolving composition. You never hear the same amount of notes. You never hear the same combination of notes twice. We joked that we got our um, honorary engineering degrees doing that project. There ended up being over 6,000 parts, individual parts. Most of them were either made or modified by ourselves. And uh, it ended up being in the key of F. It was, uh, there were uh, eight tones in three octaves. And we made a recording of it, a couple of hour long recording of it playing and had all the CDs printed and sold the CDs in the gallery. I still have them available for sale. <laughs> the piece has been um, exhibited at the museum there. It's been exhibited at the San Francisco Museum of Craft and Design, the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, and there is a small reprise exhibit of it now. It should be functioning as we speak, the tones from across the a country are in the Museum of Contemporary Craft again um, for an object focused the bowl a show that Namita Wiggers is, has up right now. And um, this is what we felt like after the project was over. But seeing a project that evolved through gave us a bit of com gave us confidence. Him as a musician, me as a glassblower, and I started to think, you know, well, again, yeah, this feeling that you can kind of do anything if you put your mind to it. It's very. Um, it builds confidence, let's say, um, and right when you get to the point where you think you want to make a large hadron collider out of glass, you end up making your best piece of all. Um, this is my daughter, her name is Cleo May. This is a little bit older picture. She is uh, turned two years old the day before yesterday. And um, certain things change in life. Uh, we lost Sonny. He had uh, brain cancer. Stage four glastomal divergent brain cancer. But um, he had a heck of a good run. I really wish he was here today. I also moved into a new shop. Um, I outgrew my own little garage and I moved into this um, great shop in a great neighborhood in Portland. I'm in with a blacksmith, uh, Denny Schuler. This is a lot of his blacksmithing equipment there and working with him has allowed me a, a, lot, uh, a lot of access to metal. This is my new lap wheel and my new studio space where I am every day. And this is some a newer work um, coming up. I'll be quick with this. Um, these are some reliquary jars. I saw things similar in the Corning Museum. I wanted to do them my own way and add my own bits of ephemera. But I was contacted. I have a relationship with the Wexler Gallery in Pennsylvania. And he saw these pieces and contacted me and asked me if he could represent me by making pieces like this uh, to start. And um, he asked me to reinterpret those pieces for the sofa show in Chicago last year. And so I made these. I got really tired of sourcing the objects to go inside the jars. Um, what was, I couldn't choose anymore. What was, one thing was more important than the other. It became very, very difficult to choose to, you know, this, choose this, what object was significant and what wasn't. So I, it became easier to just make them myself. Um, and working with the, you know, the hard symmetry of the jars versus the really organic qualities of those, the pieces inside, that was really fun, that was really liberating. 
Those are all um, surface etched as well to provide a little contrast. This is a very difficult thing to take a photograph of, by the way. <coughs> Denny made the table, my studio partner. Um, he's a great blacksmith with all of these hand forged details. That's burnt, uh, charred redwood slab, and it just has a lot of good details in there. And he makes the stands for some of the other work that grew out of that project. Uh, again, working a little bit more organically for fun. I was approached by an interior designer in Portland. She needed a screen for an office building. Uh, I had worked on projects with her before. In this office building, there was two, uh, two pairs of people that had to work in the same room and communicate, but they didn't like each other. So they needed a screen in between the table. And so I uh, drew up a, a sort of a pr proposal for a screen. Um, Jessica, uh, the designer's name is Jessica, she said, can you make something like this? And gave me a rough sketch, and I came back at her with this rough sketch. And this is how the piece turned out. Um, sort of less screen-like, but it is dense enough to uh, provide at least sort of a visual, <coughs> a visual sort of pause in the middle of what turned out to be quite a remarkable room. Um, and so out of that grew a new project with Denny. Um, Mr. Wexler asked uh, if we could uh, take this to a, take something to another design show, and he gave me the dimensions. Can you make it 10 feet wide and 10 feet tall? Whew. Okay, so Denny welded up these frames, and this piece has 175 parts to it, and shipping it across the country was pretty difficult. Working with Denny, we have access to a laser cutter, water jet machine, and it's starting to come out in pieces like this. The base there is there's walnut, um, you know, a burnt walnut panels down there to hide a lot of hardware that strings this glass up, and uh, those laser jet, uh, laser cut feet. The, the machine also cuts glass, it's a great tool. And uh, I, just to mention shipping again real quick, this is shipping that piece there. The crate was six feet tall and 12 feet long and they had a very difficult time taking it out of the truck because it weighed 1,300 pounds. <laughs> That's a picture of me freaking out, completely freaking out. That's where I go to when I'm like going to a dark place. They had this thing on the forklift and they had to pull it out, put the other end on the back of the truck and slowly take it down. Again, once you ship something all the way across the country, it better arrive in, in good shape. And so that's uh, got us up to date. And this is, uh, this is my family, that's Belle. And this is Cleo uh, a couple of weeks ago. She's sweet pie, just hear her uh, making mischief right here. So she, I say, Dada, I'm making mischief. <laughs> she runs away from you. Um, and that's it. That's, this is, that's the end. I decided to end it with this. Um, that's my long-winded story about how uh, glass sort of has had its way with me. And uh, this might have been, uh, had, had wood hooked me the same way, it's just probably a little bit of how the story would have looked. I love looking at that picture. And that's it. If you'd like, if you have any questions, I hope it didn't go over time.